For this second part of nerve cells and nerve impulses, I'll discuss the blood-brain barrier uh, rather briefly, in, in my opinion, but um, I'll do that a bit, and then start talking about the nerve impulses or this um, conduction down the axon. And um, I think it's going to get interrupted here, which I think is, a, is probably a good thing as uh, it's, a good, it's a good place to do some of this on, on Monday where you guys can ask questions and potentially, if I can draw using the, the, the um, tools in Blackboard Collaborate, I can draw the, the neuron or, or work from a, a PDF or something. The blood-brain barrier is a mechanism that, so we have this barrier surrounding the brain and blocking most chemicals from entering. And um, we want this very badly. Uh, in the rest of our body, we have this immune system, we have um, T cells, we have B cells uh, creating antibodies that are destroying damaged and infected cells throughout the body. And we don't really have this in the brain. We have the microglia, but they don't do quite the same kind of job as the immune system does. We also have some cell regeneration in the rest of the body, whereas um, neurons generally do not regenerate in that same kind of way. <clears throat> what this picture is showing is um, capillaries in the uh, body everywhere other than the brain. They have these kind of gaps that permit the flow of substances in and out of those out of the um, blood in those areas. Uh, the capillaries in the brain, those little, uh, they're really hard to see on this slide, but those little, uh, little tiny holes or gaps, those do not exist. The other thing here though, if you remember on the slide that showed the astrocyte having those little feet along the blood-brain barrier, they also provide um, some blockage for those chemicals. So we have a number of protections from the blood-brain barrier. So as I've mentioned, I like I like the pictures and I like talking from pictures. They they help me to kind of visualize some things. I'm going to start with this picture, but then explain it all with with language on the slides as well. So what the blood brain barrier, because that is blocking uh, chemicals from getting into the brain, we need we need certain things to uh, influence the brain. Mostly, well, really importantly, we need glucose and oxygen. Right? It's just some examples of what's really important to get into the brain. So some of the things that do cross the blood-brain barrier, those uncharged molecules like um, carbon dioxide and oxygen, they cross easily. Uh, we also see that um, fat-soluble mole molecules cross uh, without any kind of energy being expended. So any kind of psychoactive substance or drug that affects the brain is going to be fat soluble soluble is it's affecting the brain and then we have some active transport systems uh, glucose is actively it takes energy to transport glucose to the brain and we also have um, what he calls here an amino acid transport so this transports actually several things um, amino acids some hormones vitamins and so forth to get those things that the brain needs into the brain. So as I said, I'm going to, I did that really briefly with the picture. I'm going to put the language with the language that's on the, the verbiage that's on the slides. So I was talking about the active transport systems, that that is a protein mediated process. So we are using energy to pump those chemicals from the blood into the brain. And we have a system for glucose as the brain needs its glucose, but it needs other things as well. So uh, an active transport system allows for um, the passage of um, certain hormones, uh, amino acids, and a, and a few vitamins. So importantly, uh, vitamin B1 or a thiamine, which allows for, uh, allows neurons to um, metabolize glucose. All of those are brought to the brain again by active transport, something that really takes energy. The blood-brain barrier is essential to health, but it also poses some problems. So um, some chemicals don't get through that it would 
be helpful for us if they were allowed through. So the chemicals used in chemotherapy, they don't pass through the blood-brain barrier. So if someone has brain cancer and it looks like it's uh, growing or it's really going to cause some kind of problem, we have to go in surgically because there's no uh, chemotherapy that will help with that. Again, some of the things that um, need to get through to the brain are um, important for the nourishment and for um, cells to keep their energy and to keep going. So glu glucose, is it provides the energy uh, for the cells. That is what's changed into ATP or the cell's energy. Uh, this is one of the few nutrients that has passed through its own kind of active transport system and one of the few nutrients that passes through to the blood through the blood brain barrier neurons also need another thing they're using all the time is oxygen and in fact 20 percent of all oxygen consumed by the body is being used by the brain and then as i mentioned on the last slide with the with the vitamins the body needs vitamin b1 or thiamine in order to utilize glucose and here I do this very short, and we're going to talk about Korsakoff's syndrome again. But Korsakoff's is a um, uh, a brain disorder where really a person has been drinking, uh, probably drinking hard al alcohol, very heavily for a long time. It's pretty um, serious long-term alcoholism, where um, they're really not getting nutrients to the body very well at all in general because when we're drinking alcohol, it closes up the, the villi of the cells, which does not allow for nutrients to pass through. So we're not really using our nutrients very well um, throughout the body. But it also looks like we have this kind of leaching off of vitamin B1. I mean, even taking a vitamin doesn't help. Uh, I think a lot of people say it's a lot of the hardcore alcoholics that get Korsakoff's, they also don't eat well. They're really drinking their drinking their dinner, drinking their, their breakfast. But even if you're taking vitamin B1, it looks like it doesn't help um, as it's just not being metabolized uh, appropriately. And Korsakoff's is a, so a memory disorder where they aren't laying down new memories very well at all, maybe not at all, and they'll tend to uh, confabulate and um, make up to some extent um, what they did last weekend or whatever and it might be something based on something that they did do back in the past at some point but they're just kind of putting in information where um, they're incorrect they don't because they have no memory of uh, what they did so i'm going to do this again talking from the picture and then going through some slides that have the verbiage. I like pictures, they help me. I don't know how other people feel, but it's it. I like talking from the picture, but I do want you to have the, the words and the language. Um, so this is a single neuron, a touch receptor. So presuming I'm being touched and I'm actually feeling that touch, uh, that touch receptor is going to send its electrical signal. So we're gonna have this electrical conduction down its nerve fiber which is used interchangeably with the word axon. Okay, so down its axon. And you can see at the end of the axon, we see those um, presynaptic terminals that are communicating with the postsynaptic neuron or the receiving neuron. And you can see that sometimes they're communicating with the dendrites. And in that one, that's that synapse that's being pointed to, it's, it's actually communicating with the cell body directly. Those synapses, okay, are the microscopic gaps between the sending neuron and the receiving neuron. And that's where we're gonna to have to have some chemical release for those two neurons to communicate with each other. And again, presuming I'm feeling the touch, that postsynaptic neuron is uh, getting enough of a excitatory signal that it's gonna send its information down its axon. It's gonna send this electrical signal so that it can communicate to neurons down the line saying, yes, we're feeling, we're feeling, we're being touched right now. Okay, I do like to provide this distinction between single neurons and nerves, where a nerve, if you already noticed the nerve fiber being used as the terminology for the axon, this word nerves is, um, it gets used in many different ways. And so uh, a single neuron, it's gonna have its 
axon and it's going to send information along its axon. But sometimes we have something like, like for example, the optic nerve. The optic nerve is carrying signals out of the back of the eye. Well, this optic nerve is actually made up of millions of axons. Okay, so the axons of many neurons are in this kind of, if you, if you think of it as a, as a cable, in this kind of cable, taking information from the eye to the brain. And what we're going to show here is recording from one of the small fibers within the optic nerve. And again, we might call that a nerve fiber or a single neuron or an axon, and that kind of gets used, that word nerve gets used interchangeably, but sometimes we are talking about these just cables of axons or nerve fibers. So now I'm gonna walk through the method and then do it a little bit again with a, with a picture where um, we're gonna have a recording electrode uh, where we can record the electrical signals that are occurring down an axon. They usually actually put this recording electrode um, resting right against the axon. We don't pierce the axon, but this, it can record the electrical signals from within that axon. And then there's a second electrode, which we're gonna call here a reference electrode. They're gonna put that off somewhere in the extracellular fluid. So it's located where the action potential, where what's happening in that axon is not going to affect the reference electrode. And so when we're looking at what, what's happening in the axon, at this, what's happening with the recording electrode, we're actually gonna be looking at the difference in charge between these two electrodes. So we're making this comparison of the axon to um, what's happening in the extracellular fluid where the action potential is not affecting it. And we use something called an oscilloscope which indicates this difference in charge by a small dot on the screen. And that moves across the screen um, across time. So it creates this line as it's moving in time. Let's see the picture. So we're gonna look at that same touch cell or touch sensory neuron. And we are feeling the touch. And so we're gonna see this um, electrophysical conduction down the axon. We're actually going to see this kind of build up at the axon hillock right behind the cell cell body there. And what this picture is showing is the um, the meter, the recording electrode that is, it says there inside the axon, but really right next to the axon where it can be influenced by the action potential. And that it is also connected to a reference electrode that's out in the extracellular fluid outside the the axon and so as long as nothing's happening okay when we're looking at this comparison of the recording electrode to um, or what's happening in the axon to what's happening in the extracellular fluid uh, if we're looking at that um, point of the voltage at that time in that comparison we have negative 70 millivolts and that's what's being shown in our figure in our graph over there and that resting potential um, so that is called the resting potential. And so if nothing's happening, it's going to stay there at negative 70 millivolts. But so, okay, somebody touches us and that touch receptor is going to communicate that. So we see this nerve impulse gets sent down the axon. And what we see as that nerve impulse is sent, so I'm going to walk us through here, B, C, and D. Uh, first, we see a rise in the charge from negative 70 millivolts to positive 40 millivolts. And then as that nerve impulse is continuing to pass by that electrode, we see the charge go back down. It goes from positive 40 millivolts and it starts to head back down to negative 70 millivolts, or actually it goes a little tiny bit lower. And so we're back at resting level. And in D, the nerve impulse has just passed and we're back at the, the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. Now we're going to walk through what's causing that change in um, electrical charge or in the voltage of the axon. And for us to understand the what's happening at that on that oscilloscope with that change in voltage, uh, it's important to understand the components of a neuron's liquid environment. So what this is showing is um, sodium, the Na plus is sodium and potassium. The K plus is, is potassium. Uh, and there are actually uh, anions 
and um, chloride ions that are um, negatively charged that I'm going to ignore for, for all of this. But just so we have this, because um, what's happening that's important is between the sodium and the potassium. And you can see that there are, that sodium and potassium are both positively charged ions and that there is more sodium outside of the neuron than inside. There's more potassium inside than outside. But what this gives us at the very beginning is when we are comparing what's in that axon, what's inside the neurons liquid environment compared to outside, it is negatively charged. Okay, there's more um, negative ions inside and more positive ions outside. So I'm going to start out with what I think is a more simple explanation and then get into really the physics behind why this is happening. And I think that will might be happening on Monday. Um, so as that nerve impulse gets to our recording electrode, uh, what we see is um, what's actually happening with the impulse is that sodium is flowing into the axon and it's positively charged. So our axon within the neuron now, we're going from that resting potential of negative 70 millivolts, sodium flows in and flows in and flows in, taking, bringing in its positive charge until we get up to 40 millivolts, uh, which is the action potential. And then as that nerve impulse continues to move on by, uh, what we see is actually the sodium channels snap shut, so sodium is no longer flowing in, and we see those potassium ions are flowing out, taking their positive charge outside of the cell. So we see this flowing out, flowing out, which is the um, what the graph is showing over to the right as we're going now from positive 40 millivolts and becoming more and more negative until we get down to um, really a little tiny bit below negative 70 millivolts. And the very last in C, what's being shown is here, the nerve impulse has passed and we're back at resting potential. So I'm going to do this again with the with the verbiage and the language just to make sure I say things the way I uh, the way I want to say them as well. So the membrane is of a neuron is maintaining an electrical gradient, which is the, the gradient is this difference in electrical charge uh, inside compared to outside of the cell. And this is known as polarization, right? So anything that's different from zero is is polarized. When we're together and we're the same, we are not polarized. So at rest, the membrane is, is going to maintain this electrical polarization, so this uh, difference in the charge uh, between inside the cell and outside of the cell. And inside of the membrane, it's slightly negative. It's approximately negative 70 millivolts. This is the resting potential, which is the state that the neuron is in uh, prior to the sending of a nerve impulse. Whenever I'm not sending an action potential, I'm at this resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. So the membrane is selectively permeable. It allows some chemicals to pass more freely than others. We saw before the membrane has these protein channels, right? And they can allow certain ions to pass and not allow other ions to pass. So we have sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride as our basic makeup of, the, um, of what's in neurons and what's in the extracellular fluid. And, um, those channels uh, are often closed. So when, so when the membrane's at rest, the sodium channels are closed completely, so sodium is not allowed to um, come in or to, to leave. Potassium channels are partially closed, uh, allowing this kind of slow passage of potassium. But if we look at what's happening, so pa remember potassium is a positively charged ion. Uh, we have more potassium inside than outside of the cell. And I'm going to go through this again with the, with the language on the slides, but with that kind of electrostatic gradient, I'm a positively charged ion. I'm going to tend to stay inside the cell. Uh, there is more potassium inside than outside, so that kind of concentration gradient, I might, I might be uh, somewhat tempted, if we're going to anthropomorphize potassium, to, to go outside of the cell. But for them, there, we see a real slow passage of potassium. 
And finally, when all of this is over, so we've had our, our action potential, the um, sodium has flowed in, causing us to go from negative 70 up to positive 40 millivolts. The potassium has flowed out, so causing us to go from positive 40 uh, back down just below negative 70 millivolts. And if you're like me, you're thinking, well, now everything's in the wrong place for us to, to have that occur again. Well, this really, again, something that takes energy, this active system called the sodium potassium pump, that is going to um, pump three sodium, uh, sodium ions out of the cell at, while it's drawing in two potassium ions into the cell, and it's going to help maintain that electrical gradient and those concentration gradients as, as well so that we can, we can have the process occur again. So I'm going to end there because I'm going to do this short kind of summary with my picture here. Um, if you, so if we look at this picture, just remember that we're looking at, at that electrical signal going down the nerve fiber, going down the axon. So everything that I just discussed, um, we're going to see this start really close to the axon terminal. So right where that axon starts from the cell body. And then that same process is going to happen. It's going to be propagated all the way down uh, until we get to those presynaptic terminals. Okay, and then we're going to see, of course, the, the change in, in dealing with the, the release of the neurotransmitters. But that, that happened, that, um, those sodium channels opening, sodium flowing in, potassium flowing out, and as we see a change in that charge from negative 70 up to positive 40 millivolts, I'm going to then influence the, the area that comes next down the line and this is just a propagated response that goes all the way down the the axon so i hope that that made sense and i again most of this there are still some uh, slight complications or a little bit more description of the physics to put in there so um, i will finish this on monday which is good because i think it allows for that'll allow for uh, some questions on monday i plan to come back just momentarily to that idea of the possible definitions of consciousness so that hopefully some people have thought through that or have something they want to say and and share and um and it's friday so everybody have a great weekend i hope everyone's figuring things out really well i have not gotten a lot of questions which concerns me a little bit um, people are confused and not letting me know so um let me know if you're confused about anything again have a great weekend and we'll finish this on uh the nerve cells and uh, neural conduction, neural communication on Monday.